So um, first off, thank you all for, for coming this evening uh, to the Museum of Anthropology. I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Susan Rowley. I have the really great pleasure of being a curator uh, here at the Museum of Anthropology and an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology. And the uh, area that I've been trained in is in archaeology, and the area where I've done most of my field work is up in the Arctic. Um, of course, when you go somewhere as a curator, you don't get to pick and choose what you want to do. You actually end up with a whole slew of areas. And so I have uh, the, the wonderful responsibility of looking after the entire Circumpolar Collection uh, for the Museum of Anthropology. And so tonight, what we wanted to do was to provide you with a bit of context for the two uh, fabulous exhibits uh, that we have in the O'Dane Gallery currently. Some of you have seen the exhibits, and some of you probably haven't had the opportunity to see the exhibits. So for those of you that haven't had the opportunity to see them, one of the exhibits is called Inuit Prince, Japanese Inspiration, curated by my colleague at the Canadian Museum of Civilization, Norman Verano. And it looks at the first years of printmaking in the community of King Ait or Cape Dorset in southern Baffin Island. The second exhibit was curated by students uh, here in the Museum of Anthropology, and it's near and dear to my heart. It's called Faces and Voices of the Inuit Art Market, and the reason that it's near and dear to my heart is because I was one of the professors teaching uh, the students this year. I've chosen to focus on the time period for this talk, calling it Creating a Market for Inuit Art, 1949 to 67, because it was during this time period that the federal government working with different organizations, really created the framework that still defines how the market for Inuit art functions today. So for those of you that aren't um, necessarily familiar uh, with the Inuit, the Inuit are one of Canada's Aboriginal peoples, and they inhabit an area that stretches from Siberia in the west to Greenland in the east. But for the purposes of tonight's uh, talk, we'll be focusing on uh, those uh, Inuit um, where Canada now exists. So basically, from the Alaska border all the way over to Nunatsiavut, or the uh, far um, western part of Labrador. The Inuit began to enter the global economy, really going back as far as the Norse when they started exploring uh, into Greenland beginning about AD 1000 and you see a trade going back and forth. The, 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 uh, the Scandinavian king at the time had a throne made out of narwhal tusks and walrus ivory and walrus ivory was ending up uh, in um, the papal coffers. So you see a huge um, economy uh, from the north even starting back um, at, during that time period that we don't really think of it. But really what begins to pick up over the time period of European exploration is the entrance of Inuit into this global economy. And what are the things that we see going back and forth in terms of, thing, of, of exchanges going on? One of the things that we see very early on in the, in the 1700s when Europeans, particularly the British, were exploring uh, in the far north was that the commodity that most Inuit were interested in was wood because wood was something that in the north doesn't exist. And so uh, traders or, or explorers wanting to take back someone's harpoon would find it very hard to, for the, the, Inuit, the Inuk to part with the shaft, but very happy to give up the ivory, which was, of course, all the European was particularly interested in. Not just um, objects of daily use were being taken back but actually models were being commissioned and taken back. And what we have here from the Museum of Anthropology collection, and with the exception of, I think, one slide, everything I'm going to show you are pieces from the collection here to really give you a sense for, for, for the, the museum's collection. It's a kayak and paddle model that were collected by J.D. Moody in 1905 and are very typical of the kinds of models that you see uh, in collections that people were taking home really as souvenirs and gifts and things to go into museum collections. Following on from the time of exploration and exploitation, we also see a time period where we see the missionization of the North occurring. 
And during this time period, the missionaries, when they come back south or back to uh, Europe, they're going around and they're doing exactly what I'm doing tonight. They're giving lectures to people. And they're in that time period using glass slides. And they're showing people what the North looks like. But they also bring back many small ivory models in order to show people the things that they can't show them through the slides. So how a dog team is set up, for example. This was a classic thing. And these were used um, at these events, particularly in England, by the Church Missionary Society, who were getting people to come and make donations so that the missionaries could continue uh, their work in the North. So you see very early on these sorts of um, ivory models being used in the trade. And whalers as well were taking ivory models uh, back home with them. During World War II, or just when World War II began, there was a real concern um, on the part of the Allies that there were going to be enormous casualties in the war. And one of the things that they wanted to do was to create a route, a system, whereby people who were badly injured could be medevaced out of Europe into hospitals in Can southern Canada and the United States. And so they developed something called the Crimson Staging Route. And while it wasn't heavily used during the war, it led to the construction of airports in Iceland, Greenland, and in northern Canada, in Iqaluit, uh, in Kujuak, in Coral Harbor, and down in Churchill. And these created the beginnings of a northern infrastructure for air flight uh, into the north. What also happened at the end of the war was that Canada became very much involved in the world and going out and saying that everybody should have access to health care, everybody should have access to education. Um, and really then they began to look around and see that in their own backyard in the north there were still people who starved to death in the 1940s. And so, uh, based on a, a paternalistic approach, a sense that the Inuit couldn't do for themselves, so they had to be looked after, there were drastic actions taken immediately following the Second World War uh, by the federal government. Some motivated through good intentions, others through ignorance, but all colored uh, through the lens of a southern society that really viewed the North as far distance and acculturation of Inuit into a southern society as an inevitability. So one of the things that people looked about was, they were, as I said, they were concerned about education, health, and welfare. How do you provide a means of creating a livelihood? How and what? These were the questions that people in the South were wrestling, not with asking people in the North. But the decision was, was hunting a sustainable lifestyle? What else could Inuit do? Decisions were made without consultation. Um, but it should always be remembered that Inuit were not just passive receptors of this change. However, in many cases, there wasn't much they could do. Many avenues were suggested and trialed. These, continue, these included mining, about which I'll, I'll touch on briefly later, fishing, seal tanning, and of course, arts and crafts. One of the most important organizations involved in the um, development of the uh, of Inuit art was the Canadian Handicrafts Guild. This group was founded in 1906 to encourage, improve, and stimulate the production of crafts. And very early on, beginning in about 1907, they decided that this included not just the crafts and arts of the settler population, but also of the indigenous population of, of Canada. And in 1911, they actually petitioned the federal government to be allowed to create the coronation gift to Queen Mary. And in that are included examples of crafts from across Canada and arts from First Nations across Canada, including an ivory kayak from Hudson Strait. In 1939, they formed something called the Indian and Eskimo Art Committee looking again at this idea of what kind of a livelihood, what kind of a way could you bring a northern community into a southern market economy. In 1948, 
um, a young man by the name of James Houston traveled as many artists, such as Lauren Harris from the Group of Seven, had previously gone, so traveling in others' footsteps, to the north. And as many artists do, he made little sketches when he was up north and would give them to people so he might sketch you and, and hand you the picture that he'd made of you. Uh, one day he sketched a picture of a, of a woman and handed the picture to her husband and he turned around, went back into his tent and brought him a small carving of a caribou, or at least this is the story as told by James Houston. Um, and from this, he was entranced by this caribou carving by New York, which is now in the Canadian Museum of Civilization in Gatineau. He brought some carvings back south with him and took them to the Canadian Handicrafts Guild. And they hired him in 1949 as their Inuit art advisor. And with funding from the Canadian government, Houston traveled back north to the communities of northern Quebec, a place we now refer to as Nunavik, and brought back carvings for a sale, the first sale put up by the Canadian Handicrafts Guild that was just of Inuit art was in November 21st, 1949, and it sold out almost immediately. So they began to sense that there was a market there for Inuit art. And in the 1940, from 1949 through the 1950s, the Canadian Handicrafts Guild was responsible for most sales and exhibits with federal funding from the Canadian government of Inuit art. So one of the things that they thought was really important to do was to send James Houston back north. So Houston, the Guild, and the government got together and they thought about what are the important things? You have to make a connection between the creators of art and the potential buyers. What would people in the South buy? And this was something that Inuit artists wanted to know as well. Right? It's one of those questions that, 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 they always, that people always have, especially when you're living far distance and you don't have any experience of the culture to which you're transmitting the material. And so someone like James Houston became one of the first cultural brokers in a series of cultural brokers hired by the Guild and by the federal government. They were looking to create a mass market. They wanted, they thought it was really important to get a carving into a person's hands. For Houston, the tactile experience of holding a carving was one of those critically important things for uh, moving, for having people interested in purchasing. So he wrote this book, Sana Yaksak, and it was published in 1951. It's actually one of the first publications in Inuktitut that's not uh, Christian in terms of being a Bible or some other uh, Christian missionary activity. The book was put forward in the hope that the illustrations, which were all done by Houston, would suggest some of the things that might be useful and acceptable to the white man. Now it's here in this book where one of the really intriguing seeds that continues to haunt the topic of Inuit art is sown. Because he says in the book that there's no limitations, but for example, all sewing must be done by hand and sinew should be used when available. And that the Eskimo should be encouraged to use only the materials native to his land, such as ivory, stone, bone, skins, grass, copper. And so this sets up an argument that continues to this day on the nature of authenticity. And what is authentic Inuit art? If an Inuk creates a piece out of plastic, is that authentic? Right? I think we all have our own ideas about that. So here is something else you can see. Everybody knew at the time that model totem poles were, were very popular. So he created a drawing of a model totem pole. And on the uh, right hand side, you can see, uh, left hand side, you can see a piece that Audrey Hawthorne purchased in 1951 from the Quest Gallery. Uh, here in Vancouver, and you can see that the artist has very carefully created the base to be almost identical to the walrus <laughs> at the base of this piece, and actually gone on to, yes, it's different, but they're both bears and they're both birds. So this mirroring of what was in uh, Houston's book, and we see this in some of the early art, 
Uh, for example, this piece here, this is one of the few um, examples that I know. We're very lucky to have this piece here at the Museum of Anthropology. Um, it's a goose wing brush. And uh, Houston wrote that all the meat should be cleaned away carefully so it will not smell. And a carved ivory or stone handle or a handle of grass should be created. And I just included here a, a quick close up for you to really get an impression of, of the work that was being done at the time. Games. I think probably many of us when we were young played the game where you jump the peg over and try to end up with the last peg in the center of the board. And again, this was something that he felt people should create, but uh, somehow make it um, Inuit by adding um, a walrus head. Smoking at the time was very popular and there are illustrations throughout for ashtrays and there were illustrations for match holders. And this is a, this is a match holder. Uh, this piece here actually has um, Inuktitut written on the side of it, the syllabic script, and it says, Tukua akikit tisamat, supama inulu kina atausik, which translated means on top for ptarmigan, on the side, one Inuit face. <laughs> So, very literal, but does actually help us as a museum know that we've actually lost two of the ptarmigan. This is actually one of my favorite carvings from Moa's early pieces. It shows what's referred to as a mug up. Um, and a mug up is when you actually stop when you're out traveling on the land. You stop and you actually use your Coleman stove to heat up a kettle of water, make a mug of tea. That's what he has in his hand. And then you eat a pilot biscuit, this hard tack. Uh, and that's what he has in his other hand. These types of images of daily life were strongly encouraged, uh, but particularly when they did not show any imagery, um, as this one does, of southern influences. It was during these early years that the market system came into being that continues to this day. The Inuit art market functions differently from most art markets. So um, most Canadian First Nations artists do not have a buyer who buys their art for cash. They usually are selling their art on, cons on cons consignment, on a consignment basis. But in the Inuit art market, it's quite different. And this is only for artists who live in the north. I should also say that there are many Inuit artists who do not live uh, in the north. But this is for artists who live in Nunavut, Nunavik, and the Northwest Territories. So an artist even today will take his or her carving to the local store. In the case of this carving here from the 50s, it, would, it was to the Hudson's Bay Company, where it was evaluated by the manager of the store, who may or may not have any training in art. Right? This has changed dramatically, but in the early years, certainly uh, had not necessarily any training at all. And cash is given to the artist. So very quickly, of course, the artist knows what their materials are worth, and there's a, a negotiation that goes on. The pieces are then sent south, where nowadays wholesalers stock them to distribute to galleries around the world. And this next uh, illustration shows you uh, James Houston uh, in northern Quebec. And you can see he's surrounded by a group of girls. But this is an, an early sense of, of the kinds of things that were being collected and then shipped south. So creating the art is one thing. But how do you create a demand and a desire for that art, a sense that this is something that you should own, a sense that this is something Canadian that maybe you might want to have as, as part of your heritage as a Canadian. Well, one of the very first things that you do is you start giving Inuit art to royalty. And here we see um, Mother and Child by Shaku being packed by James Houston and Alma Houston to be shipped as the Canadian government's gift to Princess Elizabeth in 1951. So we're talking the first Inuit art show sale in Montreal 1949 to a gift to the princess, the future queen, in 1951. So you can see how the, 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 the government's involvement in the creation of this market, and this continues. Um, and we do have one example in the MOA collections that I'm just going to show you briefly. This is a chess set that was by an artist from Iglulik called Pakom Kulout. And it was presented to Queen Elizabeth 
uh, the second, the, first, the, the former Princess Elizabeth, in 1964 because it was known that she plays chess. And uh, this chess set is also by Pakom Kulaut. And this, in fact, is, as far as we can tell, the first chess set that he ever carved. So the one from 60, this is from 1960, and it was actually um, a piece that was commissioned. And this is a side of Inuit art that is, that is sometimes forgotten, that continues uh, right through to this day, but started very early on. In this case, um, Ed Smith um, was talking to one of his cousins who worked for uh, the, worked for the Juline stations. These were the distant early warning sites that the Americans put up across the Canadian North in 1957. And he said, his, his, uh, his cousin said, you know, I go up north, I, is there anything that you would like? And Ed said, I would like a chess set. And he said, well, I don't know about that, but I'll see what I can do. And he wrote to one of the Roman Catholic priests in Iglulik, and the Roman Catholic priest said, yes, of course, uh, I know this artist, in fact, Pakom Kulaut, and he will make the carving for you. But please send up a chess set so Pakom can see what a chess set looks like. And so uh, they sent up, Ed sent up, uh, he told me, one of those very classic chess sets, I think we've all seen them, the little wooden chess sets. And you can see when you look at it here, the stands that are just like the little wooden uh, chess sets. And he asked specifically in his letter that he sent up north, please, could you make it an Inuit wooden chess set? And this was what uh, came back uh, down. So you can see that sense of, of you, create a mar you create a market by first off showing that this is something that royalty would have in their homes. Another thing that you want to do is you want to encourage museums to have pieces. Because if a museum has a piece and shows it in their collection, that's also adding value. Right? in the sense of value, not necessarily as a monetary value, but in terms of something that you might want to have uh, in your home. So, so the Canadian Handicrafts Guild actually encouraged museums to collect. And the way they did that was they offered the opportunity to purchase prior to the public to museums in the mid-1950s. And uh, here is Audrey Hawthorne, the first curator uh, here at the Museum of Anthropology who, who built our early collections. And here's a letter that she wrote, November 21st, 1956, to the director of the Canadian Handicrafts Guild. And I'll just read the letter because I'm sure most of you in the back can't read it. She says, Dear Sir, I'm very anxious to obtain some of the Eskimo stone sculpture for our permanent collection. Since I am unable to take advantage of your kind invitation to attend your preview and sale on November 27th, I'm doing the next best thing. I do wish Canadian Post worked as well then, now as it does, they did then. Enclosed is a check for $50, which I hope will purchase me four or five pieces, though I do not know how prices are going this year. <laughs> I can tell some of you own Inuit art. <laughs> the pieces I would prefer are those of the human figures engaged in some activity hunting, fishing, carving, or cooking, some activity which will be illustrative of Eskimo culture. Of course, I should like these pieces to be fine carvings, too. I do hope this long-distance transaction is possible. I will be very much indebted to you for your assistance in this. Please send the box of objects COD, and I will pay express charges from here. Sincerely yours, Audrey Hawthorne. And I have actually the follow-up letter where she says, thank you so much for sending these carvings. They're so useful for our teaching collection, and they're also so charming. And so I, I just have here three pieces uh, that came up. She did actually receive five pieces for her $50. <laughs> and these are uh, three of the pieces that she received, two of which are in the student exhibit, Faces and Voices of the Inuit Art Market. Here you see this beautiful piece. Unfortunately, all the artists are known of these pieces. Beautiful piece of a woman. Uh, she's, she's actually cutting up uh, a piece of meat. And then she's got her pot over her, her stove and the boots, uh, the boots here are hanging over the lamp drying. Here we see a harpooner in the classic attitude of just about to harpoon the seal. And you can even see the little seal poking his head out, ready to be, ready to be captured. And then of this piece here, which is a, a, a hunter or a fisherman, uh, just back with his catch of a, a fabulous Arctic char. Now. 
there are many things that were happening to the Inuit at the same time period, and it's important that we remember them as well. Uh, that students were being shipped off to residential schools, that there was the relocation, the forced relocation of Inuit from northern Quebec to far distant Ellesmere Island from a land that they were used to to a land that they had no, no knowledge of. And there, was, there were also epidemics running through the north at the time. And the flu and the measles wiped people out and wiped them out very quickly. But probably the one that was the most difficult was tuberculosis. And the Canadian government at the time took the policy that the way to deal with tuberculosis was just to ship the people out of the north. So what would happen to people would be that the C.D. Howe or one of the medical ships would arrive, someone would go on board, they would be diagnosed as having TB, and in many cases they weren't even allowed off ship to go and collect things. They were taken down south immediately. And they were put in sanitaria, Sometimes they stayed there for years and years and years, seven, 12 years in some cases. In many cases, they never returned north. And in some cases, people are only today discovering where their family members are buried um, from that experience. While people were at the sanitaria in the south, um, hopefully, in some cases, at least recuperating and planning to return north, one of the things that was being done was a sense that particularly the men wouldn't be able to go out hunting again, that tuberculosis is a very damaging um, lung disease, and therefore that you should have another activity. And so they introduced um, carving. They actually shipped stone from northern Quebec, northern Ontario, Timmins, Ontario, down to Sanitaria in Hamilton and Montreal uh, and um, other parts of Canada for Inuit to be able to carve. And so this is just a, this is just a great photograph showing um, Inuit carving, um, recuperating uh, in hospital. And the women at the time were also making dolls in particular. And we're um, fortunate in, in the collection to have two examples of dolls that were uh, created during this time period. This is one of the dolls showing the front and back. Unfortunately, the, the name of the woman who created this doll is unknown, but she was a patient at the Charles Campbell. Um, hospital in Edmonton, where a number of these people uh, were sent. Um, so in the south, in the hospitals, in the north, during the 50s, thousands upon thousands of carvings were being created. It's estimated that within the first three years, something like 20,000 carvings were being shipped out of the north, were shipped out of the north to the southern market. And they were being sold in galleries throughout Canada, uh, in the United States. And in the case of this piece, we know that Audrey Hawthorne purchased it in London, England in 1959. Most of these early carvings have no signature. And this made it difficult, particularly when fakes began appearing in the market. And they began appearing almost instantly. This one is actually from slightly later, and I wanted to thank uh, Ron Appleton, who's here tonight, for the gift of, of, of this piece, which uh, comes from, from Asia, from the 70s or 80s. But even in the 50s, fakes began to appear on the market, and they appeared in all sorts of interesting ways. They appeared um, as pieces that were carved by people who were not Inuit, who lived in the South, uh, who would put on stickers that said things like, handcrafted in Canada or uh, carvings that were done in molds, right? Where they would say, handmade. Yes, it's handmade, but it's made in a mold. It's a cast, and it's not uh, made by an, by an Inuit. So there was a, a serious concern on how to maintain the market. And so the Canadian government created and trademarked something that's referred to as the igloo tag to protect the value of Inuit mar art. Because, of course, these pieces that were coming in were being sold at a much lower price point. Um, and also, at the same time, artists were strongly encouraged to sign their work. So here you see the, 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 the tag, and you can actually see that it even says here, we get this tricky word that we got earlier, uh, a guarantee of your sculpture's authenticity. So this, in this case, though, this is a guarantee that your piece was created by an Inuit artist. Now, 
So we have in the 50s then this concern over authenticity. We have this control of the market that's being run by the, the government, the Handicrafts Guild, and companies such as the Hudson's Bay. The Inuit were trying to break the control of the Hudson's Bay Company, not just on carvings, but also on the furs that they were sending south and on the imported goods that were coming in, because of course they had no control over the price point that was being set over the fur, over the, sorry, over the tea, coffee, uh, sorry, tea, coffee, flour, sugar, guns, uh, shells that they were purchasing. This led uh, to the creation of co-ops. Uh, starting in Nunavik, and that's why I just wanted to bring up this map again, starting here in Nunavik, uh, particularly in the eastern part of uh, Nunavik, and later spreading to other regions in the north. The first co-op was actually established in what, is, what used to be known as George River and is now Kangersluadjuk uh, in 1959. And Putuguk Ohitok, who was one of the founders of the, the co-op in northern Quebec, in a book called All About Co-ops, wrote, My greatest wish is to help my people. I hope that they will keep working together. I believe this is the only way in which they can truly rise. This book is for my people. I hope that it will help them. And interestingly enough, the Pavonitok co-op, when they created their own trademark, as opposed, to just the, as opposed to the igloo tag, they actually created a tag that reads, the people of Pavonitok, in common effort, independent. So we often think of the um, indigenous rights movements as starting quite a bit later. We think of it as something from the 60s and 70s, but here we, you see it happening in the 50s with the, the foundations of the co-ops um, in northern Quebec. We're now going to transfer over and talk a little bit about the beginnings of the print um, making in the Cape Dorset area. Uh, so we're moving across from here, Kangasluadjuk, George River, over to Kingite or Cape Dorset here on southern Baffin Island. And it's here that we again meet James Houston. By this time, he's no longer working for the Canadian Handicrafts Guild. He's transitioned to working as a northern administration officer for the Canadian federal government. And he's gone up to Cape Dorset and is living in Cape Dorset. And some say that the story of the beginning of printmaking is one of the best known stories uh, in Canadian art. But I think that there, I, can, I know that there are some people in this, in this audience who know the story very well, but I know that there are some people in this audience who may not, not have heard the story. And it's one of those things that we sometimes forget that in the past, almost everybody smoked. And in the past, almost everybody was familiar with this package of cigarettes, the player's navy cut with the, with the navy, naval guy. And so the story runs that Oshui Tuk Aipali, who was a very well-known at that time ivory carver, was talking to James Houston one night, and this is Houston in his home in Cape Dorset, um, and he said, to, uh, he said to James Houston, how does, that, how, how does somebody have the patience to sit there day after day making those faces of that sailor? Over and over again, that same face, he must get so bored. Um, at which point Houston realized that, well, maybe, there was, maybe he should sort of demonstrate. So he took one of Oshui Tuk's ivory carvings that was incised, and he used lamp black on it, and then took some tissue paper, and he just rolled it over multiple times. And, as he, and then he was able to show Oshui Tuk, see, you can make lots of copies of the same things. At which point the famous statement is supposed to be by Oshui Tuk Aipoli, we could do that. And hence the, the birth of printmaking um, in Cape Dorset. However, on the side, we happen to know that in the, early in the mid 50s, Houston and Alma Houston had already put forward a proposal to do textiles and Christmas cards in Cape Dorset. So there was already the beginnings of an idea of a, of a print uh, making industry. Um, but Houston very early on, if you go into the Inuit Prince Japanese Inspiration Show, immediately on your left hand side, you will see some of the first prints that they did, the experiments that they tried in 1957. And look particularly carefully at the one of the woman holding two water buckets. Because in that print, as Norman Verano pointed out uh, to a group of us, you can see that they didn't understand how to register, how to do multiple colors and get things to line up properly. And so uh, Houston actually put forward to the Canadian government that they should fund him to go to Japan to study printmaking. And the Canadian government said, okay. 
And so he went off to Japan and he studied in Japan for three months. And when he came back, he not just brought, he not only brought back Japanese printmaking techniques, he also brought back a series of Japanese prints to show uh, Inuit artists how prints were created. And from that, the print industry started. And they founded, in late 1959, they founded the West Baffin Eskimo Co-op, which still exists and still produces the prints today. And this is a print from the very first collection, 1959, by Nivyasiak. And I'd just like you to note that this is written down here, at the bottom here. You can't read it, probably. It says, Caribou Winterlight Skin Stencil. Okay. Now in this, oh, you need me to do, get my hair out of the way? Apologies. Sorry, UBC is creating a podcast, and <laughs> I guess my hair is getting in the way. Um, let me just do one thing to help you out. There. How's that? Better? Okay. So one of the things that I'd like you to just notice is that it says that it's a skin stencil, and I'm going to come back to this in just a second, because this is, Houston had a great deal of concern about printmaking and issues of acceptance of prints as authentic Inuit art by a southern audience. Many of the prints were created using stone blocks. So what would happen would be that artists would create drawings. These drawings were then purchased by the co-op, by the West Baffin Eskimo Co-op, and then they were transformed by other artists onto stone blocks, and then the prints were pulled. After 50 prints, the box were to be destroyed or altered so that no other prints could be pulled. A few blocks exist in collections, and in Inuit prints, Japanese inspirations, you can see the stone block for this print here. And we're very fortunate that we have this print, a uh, copy of this print here in the collection. This print is from the 1961 collection. And it also claims on it that it is a sealskin stencil. But by this time, this term we know is inaccurate. But it's still being handwritten on the prints. In fact, these were created using a homemade heavy waxed paper. Because they quickly discovered that using sealskin was actually really difficult and didn't lead to a good print edge. Another concern of Houston's about the acceptance of printmaking uh, and authenticity was how to get people to accept the images. And so what he said was, well, they're on paper, so that might not be considered authentic, but the th what if we kept the themes traditional? So in the early prints, you see a real push to keep the themes as so-called life on the land, family, hunting, wildlife, Inuit cosmology, despite the movement of people in the early 60s into wooden houses. Um, and in fact, later on, it turns out with the prints of uh, artists such as Pudlo Pudlat, who did a lot of prints of airplanes and helicopters um, and Christian uh, themes, that this was not actually a concern of the, of the print buying public. But it was a concern of Houston's at the time. In 1961, a very important committee is, is set up, um, and it plays a, a, a pivotal role uh, in Inuit art from 1961 to 1989, when it transitions into a group that still exists, the Inuit Art Foundation, and runs a magazine called the Inuit Art Quarterly. But the Canadian Eskimo Arts Committee was set up in 1961 by the Department of Indian Affairs and Northern, by the Department of Indian and Northern Affairs, and there's, it's always put forward that the West Baffin Eskimo Co-op asked for this group to be set up. And the idea was that this was a group of experts in the South who would ensure the quality of Inuit art, especially the graphic arts, and that they would also promote Inuit art around the world. Because what was happening at the time was a concern about value, tourist arts versus fine arts. The collections of Cape Dorset prints, 59 and 60, 61, sold out almost immediately. There were lineups to buy them. People were apoplectic when they found out that huge numbers had gone to New York City or in Toronto and they couldn't buy them because they were at a dealer in New York City and what was going on. Um, and so there was this, why not just print more than 50? Why not print 100? 
and there was a decision that they actually wanted to look at the issue of quality versus quantity. They also, but interestingly enough, by taking control over the graphic arts, this group of southerners was actually deciding which prints could be sold and which prints could not be sold. So here you have a really interesting system that existed for a while of non-Inuit making decisions of what was authentic Inuit art. So they played, a, as I said, a very important role, and, but when other communities tried to get into the printmaking market, uh, Pavonituk, Holman, Baker Lake, what would happen to them inevitably in their very first push forward was that their prints would be rejected by the committee. And there would be training sessions set up and eventually they would all start. Uh, they would all start. But this committee actually held very strong control over uh, what could and could not be sold. And I included this because this is just an image following on from after the establishment of this committee. One of the things that they were able to do, however, was when uh, someone came to the foreground who lived in a community where there weren't prints being made and they thought a print should be made of their work, they were able to actually take the drawing and send it to Cape Dorset. And this is an image of Jessie Unark. Uh, and now Jessie Unark is a really interesting example. She is from the west coast of Hudson's Bay, uh, from the community of Baker Lake, er, or from the area around Baker Lake, um, she ran into a wildlife officer by the name of Andrew McPherson who handed her cr uh, crayons and a sketchbook. And she created sketches, which he then took south and sold for $5 a piece. Um, and members of the Eskimo Art Council saw some of these and thought that at least one of them would be trans could be transformed into a print. And so actually, her early prints were actually pr created by the Cape Dorset uh, Co-op before printmaking was established in Baker Lake. Another component of creating a market is to exhibit pieces, is to get pieces out there and known to a wide global audience. And so government promotion took the part of numerous avenues. We've already seen the gifts to royalty and dignitaries. The government also employed the National Film Board in 1958, they produced a promotional film on Inuit art called The Living Stone, which we show, we're showing here throughout the duration of the exhibit so that people can see that, that piece. It's a, it's a brilliant early piece of propaganda for Inuit art. Um, they also created uh, shows of Inuit art. The first one was Canadian Eskimo art from 1959 to 1962 that toured through Europe. And then uh, Doris Shadbolt, um, and probably many people who uh, have lived in Vancouver are very familiar with Doris Shadbolt, a very well-known curator at the Vancouver Art Gallery, but also a member of the Eskimo Arts Council for many, many years. Uh, she felt that it was really important to send forth another exhibit uh, that would travel throughout Europe and the United States. And it, from 1971 to 1973, the exhibit Sculpture Inuit, the Masterworks Exhibition, traveled throughout, traveled to Leningrad, Copenhagen, Paris, London, Philadelphia, New York, Toronto, Montreal. And it started here in Vancouver at the Vancouver Art Gallery. That was its first venue. She was the driving force behind the Masterworks exhibit. And this is, we're very fortunate that she bequeathed a number of pieces to the museum. And this is one of the pieces that she gave us. There are another group of people that it's important to remember. So there are the group of people in the South, the Eskimo Arts Council, people like um, Doris Shadbolt and numerous others like Bud Feely that I haven't mentioned, uh, who are working to promote Inuit art. James Houston, who worked tirelessly to promote Inuit art to a Southern audience. There were also the Northern Administrative Officers who worked in the different communities. Their role was to deal with economic issues in the communities. And their encouragement and concerns on art depended entirely on the individual, their aesthetic sense, and their ideas of what would and could sell in the South. And again, we can see some of this in the museum's collections. Here we see from Broughton Island, George Lane, who was the administrative officer in the early 60s, had an interest in the doll making and things like that. 
Another interesting example is uh, Gordon Yearsley. Um, and I'm just going to go back to the map because I hadn't meant to show you that uh, George Lane was in Kukitaujuak, Broughton Island. Gordon Yearsley was here in Apex Hill, which is a tiny community which is almost like a suburb of Iqaluit. There's about five kilometers drive uh, between the two uh, communities. And the final example I'll be talking about is Rankin Inlet over here. Gordon Yearsley was an earlier person who had a concern that Inuit art was becoming static, that those themes that I've reiterated a couple of times were becoming all you saw, they were becoming rote. And his idea was, what if you got children to draw? And you, used, you said to the children, draw things from Inuit tradition, from stories, from myths, from legends. And so the children created this artwork. And what he hoped was that the artwork of the children would inspire the adult carvers to transition and do uh, different carvings. And um, here at the museum, there are a set of 25 of these children's uh, drawings that were created. I'm not certain that that ever worked. He left almost immediately after these were created uh, and moved to uh, Pavonitok, where he was one of the people that started the printmaking um, operation in, in Pavonitok in 61. Um, the case of Rankin Inlet is quite different. Rankin Inlet is where another one of these economic trials was put forward, and this was mining which of course is huge in Nunavut, Nunavik, and Nunatsiavut today. Uh, but the Rankin Inlet mine was the first mine in the north. Uh, the idea was to create employment for Inuit. And in fact, throughout its duration, most of the miners that worked in the mine were Inuit. There were up to 500 Inuit who worked um, at the mine. Unfortunately, the mineral deposit was very limited, and it ran out it opened in 1957, and by 1962, the resources were entirely depleted. So Rankin Inlet had... The other thing I need to tell you about Rankin Inlet is that Rankin Inlet didn't exist prior to the mine being established. There was no community there. So it was an entirely established community just for the mining. So in 1962, when the mine was closed, you were left with people who had left their, their hunting areas, moved into the community, settled down in the community, become miners. Now what? So again, the, the government was left with things. They tried all sorts of experiments. They tried pig farming later on. They tried all sorts of interesting things. This is just one of the miners, Celestin Ekrajuk, working in the mine in 1960. But one of the things they then looked at was, what about the arts market? And they decided that the arts market, in terms of carving and prints, was saturated. So what about trying something new? What about trying a new medium? And so what they actually attempted in Rankin, you know, starting in 65, was ceramics. And uh, from 65 to about 77, they created a huge number of ceramics. Here you can see it's not a, uh, it's, this is from the University of Saskatchewan um, archive, so thanks to them. Uh, you can see the huge numbers of ceramics um, being created here. And I just want to show you three pieces that we have from this time period here. This is um, the woman who controls the sea animals. This is a child sledding down through the landscape. And this is a mother and child. So is there anything that you can see that we've seen before? We've got, again, a new medium being introduced, but sticking with traditional themes on the hope, again, that this will lead to uh, acceptance of this. In the case of the ceramics, the ceramics were very popular in terms of people who went to see them in an exhibit, but they weren't popular with the buying public. And they never, they never managed to take off uh, in the way that the prints did and in the way that the carvings did. Um, and in fact, as I said, the, the uh, ceramics studio folded in 77, and then was revived recently and is going strong today. I wanted to close uh, with uh, just two 
um, two more slides. Um, and to come back to this concern that Yearsley had in 58, this concern with Inuit art, and is it becoming static, is it becoming rote, uh, formulaic, is something that you see coming in cycles. It's almost as if every 10 years people will say, oh, Inuit art is gone, Inuit art is dead, uh, too, too much the same, too much catering to the market, too much this, too much that. And we see this happening in 1967 with, um, this is a recent photograph, so he was then a very young anthropologist, uh, Nelson Grayburn, who was very interested in uh, tourist arts. And he was uh, working in, uh, in Pabungtuk, and he uh, worked with the northern administrative officer there, a man by the name of Pat Furneaux. And they looked around, and, they, and Nelson said, you know, this is becoming too much the same. Too many seals, too many harpoons, too many this, too many. So what about if we created an, a competition? And so in 1967, they set forth to hold an exhibition, a competition. And the competition was called Takoshunaitok, which means things that haven't been seen before. So he asked people, or they asked people, to come up not with things that were from Inuit mythology, not to come up with things that they had seen and experienced in their life, but things that nobody had ever imagined before. That was the idea behind uh, the competition. And uh, the competition itself was held in December of 67. And this piece was the piece that won first prize in the competition, a whole $50. Uh, this is by the artist Eli Sadlua Lua Kinua Jua. Um, and we're very fortunate through a kind uh, donation and through the collecting work of Lauren Balshine, who's here today, that we actually have it uh, in the collection here at the museum. And you can see it in the, in the student exhibit. Um, these works took off, but they have still never replaced uh, that desire that exists uh, in the market um, for uh, pieces that speak of the landscape of the North and of the animals um, of the North. And in fact, um, Eli is a prolific artist who still creates artwork today. Um, so it's not until, I said this was going up until 67, there are many other important events that happen in 1967 that have to do with Inuit art. Another really interesting thing that happens in 67 is the Order of Canada is instituted. Canada's centennial. And who's, a recipient, who's one of the recipients of the Order of Canada the first time it's ever given out? One of the recipients is an Inuit artist, Kanojuak Ashavak, uh, the creator of the Enchanted Owl, which most people are very familiar with, and many other absolutely phenomenal works. Um, you also see in 67 the Canadian Pavilion. You see Expo 67. So for those of you that are from Vancouver, Expo 86 is a watershed mark. For those that are from Eastern Canada, Expo 67 uh, was a watershed for bringing uh, Canada into the wider global world in terms of culture. And the Canadian Pavilion at the time was actually called Katimavik, which is an Inuktitut word meaning meeting place. And so not only were there wonderful artworks from the Northwest Coast there, but there were many Inuit artists that were brought there who created art there. And through that work in 67, where the artists were actually on site, and through the work of Doris Shadbolt and the exhibit that went to Europe, when the artists actually went to Europe, you begin to see the beginning of, this, of Inuit art as not just Inuit art, art created by a culture, but Inuit art, art created by artists who are Inuit. So you begin to get it as art that is created by individuals. So 67 is a very uh, important um, date uh, for Inuit art. It's not until 1970 that the first gallery devoted to Inuit art opens. 
and that opened in, uh, it was called the Inuit Gallery, and it opened in Toronto. And it's also sometime around that time period, I think it's 70, Lauren can correct me if I'm wrong, that the Waddingtons holds its first auction. 78. 78, sorry. A few years wrong. 78, their first auction of Inuit art. So you see this transition of uh, Inuit art being sold in galleries that are selling other things to galleries that are selling primarily um, Inuit art. So what I hope I've, I've provided to you is a little snapshot of how the Inuit art market works, how it still functions today. So still, when we talk to artists uh, today, um, and if you go um, and meet Inuit artists, uh, such as I.T. Pujaguk or Jamesy Pitsilak and Jutai Tunu, who are just here in Vancouver, they talk about walking into the co-op with their pieces, selling them to the co-op, and then the co-op sends them down south to the wholesaler, who then sends them out um, to the wider audience. And so those of you that might want to purchase a piece of Inuit art, you might want to remember that you want to look for some of those, those clues that we've given, the signatures on the bottom, the igloo tag, or an, a tag that talks about the artist and the community um, that they're from. And, uh, and the sense that uh, one of the things that people always ask me as someone who, who works in the museum uh, is people frequently want to know what should they buy when they're looking at Inuit art. And to me, the response is always, if it's a piece that you love, you should buy it. That's always the reason for, for purchasing a piece of art, is it's something that speaks um, to you personally. So I'd just like to thank you all for being here and to open up the floor for questions. So thank you. Ron. To the letter to the um, guild uh, yeah. offering to purchase pieces, uh, what was the date of that what year? I couldn't quite see it. That was 1956. 56. Yeah, and we actually have even, um, uh, we don't have the invitation for that year, but we have the invitation for two years later that invites museum people to come a day early to purchase. So an interesting, an interesting way to make sure that the pieces are being gotten in, into collections. And I have to say, too, that... Um, one of the other things that the Eskimo Art Council really worked hard on was to get the National Gallery to collect Inuit art. Because for many years, the National Gallery said, the Canadian Museum of Civilization collects Inuit art, right? Uh, we shouldn't collect Inuit art. Um, but, the, uh, but, but, they were, but the um, Eskimo Art Council said, no, it's very important that Inuit art be considered art, not, be, do not just be in the Museum of Civilization. Yes. You said that the Kate Dorset prints uh, used to be chosen by people from the south. Yes. I didn't really understand. Did you, is that still going on now, or do they now choose the prints? The, the group that, choose, that, that makes the selection now is different, and it's made up of, of, of almost entirely Inuit artists. But in the beginning years, yes, it was made up entirely of people from the south. And um, this did lead for Pavonituk for, for at least one whole year of their collection to be turned down. So this is actually, for, for, and, um, for, uh, for Pavonituk for that uh, year, they were actually very upset because they had invested $8,000 in printing equipment and in printing the prints. So they'd already created all the prints and then they were told you can't put them on the market. Um, so they actually sold them through a different route but they couldn't get the official stamp. There was an official stamp that was put on it, which basically said authentic uh, <laughs> or real uh, was what it actually said in Inuktitut you know, that was put on it. So it was, it was uh, yeah, it was, it was that same sort of sense of all those other things that were happening at the same time. It falls very much into that, that same way of, of, of the South taking control of things. But you see the North, um, the Inuit, uh, taking control back with the, the establishment of the, of the co-ops. Yes? Uh, was not the guild the one that decided how much the artist should be paid at the beginning? Like, the artist probably didn't know what their, their art was worth. Yeah, it, it, for many, in many cases, it was the manager of the, of the <laughs> Hudson's Bay Company store that made the decision for how much something was worth. Um, and a lot of the money was provided actually um, from the federal government. 
And then there's another agency that gets involved in 65, which I didn't mention, called Canadian Arctic Producers. And they're the first big wholesalers. And so there was this sense that happened for a while in Inuit art that any piece that was created was bought. Right? Because at the t uh, at, in the beginning, there was that sense of, are we, is this art or is this welfare? Right? So if it's art, you're purchasing on the grounds of quality and you don't necessarily take everything. But if you're purchasing on the grounds of, 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 of uh, the federal government using this as a way of um, extending welfare but you know, allowing people to work for it rather than just handing it out, um, then you buy everything, even if it's for a very small um, amount. I have a, this is going to sound kind of mercenary, but when you go downtown, you see a beautiful Inuit sculpture for five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. How much, you know, modern one in the last five years? How much does the artist get? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's a good, it's a, it's a, it's a good question, and it's a hard one to answer because it does nowadays depend um, quite a lot on the artist. Uh, But there is, uh, it goes, because, it, because of the routes that it travels through and the amounts that are added onto it, uh, there's, uh, it's really hard to say, that, but there's usually a couple of hundred percent that's, that's added on from the time that it goes from the, from the community to the time that you see it. Because one of the things that the wholesaler is taking on board is the cost of transportation. Uh, so um, a lot of things used to get shipped out, but now they all get air freighted out. And so the cost of air freighting, especially when you're looking at some of those sculptures, the cost of air freighting them is, 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 uh, is quite high. So yes, there is a substantial amount on top that is being paid. I, I remember from the film a couple of weeks ago, the one artist, I believe it was the one who received the order said she didn't like when some of these James Houston, I remember, requested her to draw certain things that um, the subject that he would give the subject. And she said that she needs to use her imagination. She thought she couldn't draw that way. It sounds like that was done a lot. They were pretty much told for a long time what they were to make. Right, and this is where it's really important, this idea of, 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 of people not just as passive recipients, because one of the really intriguing things to me about that comment that she made, this is Kenojuak Ashavak, and in a film she's commenting about how James Houston, because I'm not certain everybody could hear the question, uh, that James Houston would, uh, would say to her that he wanted her to draw particular themes. And she never liked that because she liked to draw from her imagination. And one of the things that you, you, you see if you look at Kenojuak's body of work is that she clearly didn't take the direction that, that, <laughs> that he put forward. So, so uh, while he gave direction, it's very clear that there are lots of cases of people who just didn't, didn't chose not to follow that, that direction and still were very, uh, like, such as Konojo Akashavak, I mean, a great example, someone who is still incredibly successful. Um, but there was this huge concern that when you're create that among people like, such as Houston, that when you're creating a market, you do need to be very, uh, to have that concern that you create what the buyer will buy. Because if you're investing all the time, effort, and energy, and the artists are creating all this wonderful work, but no one will buy it, then you have a problem. So there was a bit of, 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 of uh, too formulaic that was in some of the early work. But sometimes when that happens, the people in the South who might be the buyers have this image of, say, the end of it to them. You know, they live in igloos and they wear you know, their silk and clothes. And, and mm -hmm. they, so that's what they want because that to them is what's going on. Um, it isn't always as, um, what do you say, um, it's not always the truth. They're, they, the buyer might be exaggerating. 
No, it's 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 very much the case, and you and you do still see it. You, there are some brilliant artists, Inuit artists, who are creating groundbreaking work. I mean, you look at the work of Jamesy Pitsilak or Jutai Tunu or Shuvanai um, Ashuna or, or some of the other um, contemporary artists, and they are creating things that are out of their lived experiences. Right, so they're high-heeled shoes, and they're flowers, and they're they're all sorts of things that are, you know, um, and and motorboats and all kinds of things that are that are that are part of daily life, skidoo parts that are turning up in carvings, um, choppers, right, motorbikes, uh, all kinds of things that are that are turning up in in, in the art to do, today. But there still is um, a cadre of people that are producing art of snow houses and skin tents and, and life as it would have been lived 30, 40 years ago, uh, rather than life as it is uh, lived today. Game, I mean, you, you nowadays find carvings of Game Boys and things like that. But, they, but I am told by one of the wholesalers that they don't sell, that there is a much smaller market for that, the Game Boys, skates, that kind of thing, than there is for the dancing bears and the Inukshuk. And his argument back would be the important thing, and this goes back to the very first day, first creation, first creation of the market, the important thing is to get a piece in someone's hands, no matter what it is, no matter how big, small, no matter what the price is, something that they can hold, it's tangible to them, and that they respond to. So it doesn't really matter if it's a dancing bear or an anukshuk or a, or a skateboard. So in some ways, it's like paying for an antique. Sorry? Um, in, in some ways, it's like paying for an antique of that culture, so something traditional, which is a long time ago. You know, although there is an interesting quote in the student exhibit that is from one of the artists, and she talks about, I create things that are the way they used to be in the past so that the children of the future will know how we used to live. So she creates carvings specifically of things that are from her childhood to keep those alive as memories for the future. Um, yes, speaking of memories for the future, um, it seems like the whole birth of this market was very well documented with photographs. Who was responsible for creating those photographs? Would it have been the guilds, or would it have been actually documented by the artists themselves? By a, of, of the of, of the market itself, yeah. and of the early days, almost anybody that was involved in the in the market was taking photographs. James Houston was taking photographs. The guild was taking photographs. Um, the people that worked for the Department of Indian Affairs and Northern Development were. Uh, taking photographs. There were all kinds of researchers taking photographs. Uh, Nelson Grayburn uh, has a huge library of, of uh, photographs. The University of Saskatchewan um, has a number of, of photographs, of, for instance, of the, uh, the ceramics from, from Rankin Inlet. So yes, in terms of, of photography, it's very well documented. Not so much by, um, by Inuit photographers but very much the sense that, that, that something was being created. And that these images, there are some very formal images. So for instance, the one of the little girls standing around with a carving table, that's, from, that's in um, the Public Archives of Canada. And that's along with a whole set of photographs that very much look like they were created for publicity purposes. So, right? so, so when you're doing an exhibit and you want something to go out there to the public, that's the sort of thing. Isn't that interesting? Yes. When did the Anukshuk start appearing as a carving thing that people bought as carvings? It appears quite early on as in prints. And that's expected because a lot of the prints show the landscape, and Anukshuks appear on the landscape as, as, as for all sorts of reasons. It occurs in carvings. It appears, starts to appear in carvings following Expo 86. And Expo 86 is where the Northwest, before Nunavut was created, the Northwest Territories, Nunavut and the Northwest Territories were one big territory. And there was a huge pavilion here created by Bing Tom. And that pavilion had in front of it the Inukshuk that now stands in English Bay. And that Inukshuk uh, was at the time billed as the world's tallest Inukshuk. 
And it seems to be that that's one of the starting points for the sort of love affair with Inukshuks. And then you start seeing them appearing uh, a little bit later than that in some of the art. They're, I mean, Ron is probably better in terms of knowing when, it, when he first started seeing Inukshuks in the art market. Your guess would be, I think after Expo yeah. and, and uh, it, the late 80s, 90s, yeah. It, it, it's really a very recent. Fairly recent. Very recent phenomenon. And then the huge impact of the, the, the ones that were produced for the, the Olympics, the ones that came in a can. Um, and were, were, were done, you know, I mean, they're, they're well packaged so that you can actually put them in your suitcase and they won't break on the way home. Um, you have nothing to worry about, but, uh, but thousands of them. I think, was it five to 7,000 of them were produced and sold during the Olympics? So they're still very popular. Lauren. I just would like to connect with your date that you chose, 1967. Yeah. Uh, that was the year that the Toronto Dominion Bank opened their tall, the tallest building in Canada, Lambert, had wanted to uh, show his collection for the Toronto Dominion Bank that he had been building to create a greater awareness and appreciation. So it was really the first time that the public saw like, a large selection of works and people are talking about quality and you know subject matter. So that was like a real push, I think, to show what the would have been doing uh, throughout the 50s and 60s. No, that's a great point. And I even remember as a child going to Toronto and going up the world's toy or the Toronto's tallest building and then and going in and being allowed to see the uh, the Inuit collection there. Yeah. Anybody else? Any questions? Yes. Yeah, are there parallels anywhere in the world that you know of? Like the way that the Inuit art market has developed? Do the different countries try to do this? There are some, paral some parallels with Australia, with, uh, with what the government tried to do with um, creating a, a market for um, Australian Aboriginal art. How about Santa Fe, New Mexico? Santa Fe is different. Uh, they have the wonderful art market in Santa Fe, the, 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 uh, the Indian art market in, in Santa Fe. And, and that whole set of art markets is, is run in a, in a slightly different way um, because, again, they're, they're juried shows and um, artists submit their work and they're not being purchased directly. So they may sell one, one piece may get bought or, or they have their booth set up and they can sell. But it's not in the same way as an artist in the North is guaranteed the sale of their piece. So an artist today living in, in Cape Dorset, I mean, Jutai Tunu carves a piece and he takes it into the co-op and he's got cash in his hand, you know, five, ten minutes later. Uh, that's the difference. Uh, whereas First Nations artists um, here in Vancouver who are um, in galleries are represented by a gallery uh, or they're working on consignment, right? So they put things together in a show and then some of them sell and some of them don't sell and there's a commission that the gallery takes. So it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a very different kind of market. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, if not, I'd like to thank you all for coming and you still have time to go and see the, see the show. So uh, please, I hope you enjoy them. Thank you.